The Middle East has certainly done a lot and it's very impressive to see the kind of strides being made, especially in countries like the UAE, in this area of technology innovation. Clearly Dubai has succeeded in innovating a number of spheres, especially around infrastructure, around finance, around tourism and many other areas. And what you see is that technology has been a very important part of a lot of the initiatives that Dubai has pioneered. The creation of cities like Knowledge City and today, for example, I went to the academic city, which attracting talent has become a very important part of Dubai's success story. So for technology leadership, what we need is good talent, good resources and a national strategy that focuses that. Today in Dubai and the UAE, you find a confluence of bringing these three things together. And that's very important. And what you also see is an increased focus on not just adoption of technology, but also on creation of original IP and creation of original technology. As you see, for example, in the creation of the Falcon, the original local context-specific LLM, the creation of new innovative company, the G42, and others. So I think there's a very important shift towards technology leadership moving beyond adoption into IP creation. Well, businesses have been using AI for several years and as the power of AI increases, they'll keep on using AI in even more innovative and creative ways. And I think the challenge out here is that in the next five, seven years, businesses will see a tremendous increase in productivity by using AI creatively. So that is something that most people expect. The question which is interesting is what happens in the next phase, beyond the next seven years. So let's say in the next seven to 15 year time frame, when AI has become so powerful that fundamentally it is able to replace a lot of the tasks that humans might be doing today in a classical office environment. And how do you in fact take intelligent machines, machines which are equally in many cases, you know, as good as human beings in many aspects and interface them with the people in the right combination. The combining people and intelligent technology is going to be a very important challenge in the next phase. So I think you know the challenge out here is that AI will continue to be used by businesses for good purposes, but how do we ensure that human rights and human interests and employment, employability are protected in the future? So it's a very interesting question about how do you regulate AI. Everyone agrees that AI needs regulation. The challenge is that if you want to regulate something, you need to understand it to some degree. And of course, we do understand some parts of AI, but large parts of AI are today being understood as we speak. And the challenge out here is that AI or AI systems is not a stable entity. It's not like we have achieved a level of progress and that is it and then we spend the next three years trying to understand what we have created. The object that we have created, the AI system, itself is evolving continuously. And as you tr seek to understand it, the system itself has changed and the powers have increased or have got, you know, in some sense, magnified in many ways. So regulation is a challenge. Now having said that, you still need to try to regulate the outcomes and be agile in terms of regulating it such that it does good and not harm for society. Clearly some parts of the world like the United, uh, like European Union have taken the lead in terms of trying to articulate a much more comprehensive view of regulation and AI. Others are trying to in fact catch up and do a little bit more in this area. But I think this area of safety, regulating AI are very important and governments have a very important role in terms of regulating. Now in the UAE and in Dubai in particular, is one of the few parts of the world where often the government and regulation is ahead of business. It's very interesting, you know, most parts of the world, the regulators and the government are behind business, but in many cases, I think the Dubai in particular, the government and regulators have been ahead of business. So what I hope is that as there's more competence and there is more expertise built up in AI in the region through the creation of 
you know, the AI ministry, the minister of AI, creation of the university on AI and so on, the regulators out here will be ahead and will show perhaps a way for the rest of the world about how to regulate AI successfully. This is a challenge which is a very important challenge that we face across all businesses. Because what we have to understand is that the power of AI is not just in analyzing a data or recognizing an image or in making a decision of some kind. Increasingly, AI systems are becoming creative. They are able to help create new designs for fashion, new industrial designs, new cars and so on. And increasingly, AI systems are also able to form relationships, you know, show empathy, make people fall in love with them. For example, in China, there is a bot called Shansei that is the girlfriend of more than 600 million Chinese males. And this is, bot was released in 2014. And this is a real life implementation of the famous movie, Her, H-E-R, that you might have seen in which the man falls in love with the operating system. And this is reality today. Machines can do data analysis better, can be as creative or similar creativity as human beings, and can actually make you fall in love with them. So all these different elements of empathy, creativity, analysis can be done in machines. So if you put these things together, intelligent AI can take over a lot of tasks of human beings. And there there's real risk and danger in terms of will businesses keep pushing the productivity frontier, keep pushing the efficiency frontier, and keep replacing human beings with technology? Or will they also be creative in terms of trying to protect some areas where human beings are required essential? And in inventing new areas where perhaps new things are done that we cannot even imagine today by combining the power of human beings and new technology. So it's a really interesting challenge in terms of how do you create the future? Let me give you an example education where I come from in a university. Now clearly in a university context, AI, suppose if intelligent tutors, can in fact potentially replace and add to the educational offering we have today. It can provide better academic support to students. It can provide better you know, support outside the classroom to students. A lot of good things can happen today. But also in the future, you might say that, well, AI can in fact replace a lot of human teachers, potentially in the future, in seven, 10, 15 years from now. How will we actually manage this ecosystem of learning if AI becomes as good as human teacher? Now the reality out here is that there are so many people who cannot have access to education around the world, especially in the global south. There are so many people whose skills are not yet upgraded to the right level and they actually are falling behind in the skills curve. So if you think about it creatively, technology with some human support can in fact help close this gap, help us reach the UN SDG goals in education. So if you think about how to in interestingly create new value from this combination of people and technology, that's a very effective way of, of trying to discover how technology can be used for the good, as opposed to just saying, well, let's just use technology to replace what you're doing right now. So the challenge really is not just making what you do right now more efficient, but creating new value and new things in the future. You know, it's very interesting and this is a question which comes up often about how are we actually using AI. And AI, there are multiple facets to it because our students will go into companies and they will actually have to use AI for the corporate purposes. They need, they need to understand something about AI strategy. So educating them about AI strategy in the classroom through electives and through case studies is a very important part of the, what you're trying to do. But beyond that, what is happening is today technology production is getting increasingly automated with AI systems. So traditionally, look at how you did computation. There were software engineers, software companies that created the software and the actual data application with the software was done by the businesses or the customers at the front end. Today, you can in fact move that whole software creation, the app creation to the front end. 
today business people can in fact create apps using just instructions telling me, okay, give me an app for getting this kind of information and making this kind of decision. It might seem a little bit science fiction right now, but it is not really science fiction. This kind of no code app development is becoming a reality, fast reality. So in business schools, we're also trying to introduce courses that actually bring students and make them develop apps with very little knowledge of formal computer science. And that's very important for both innovation and also making them comfortable with technology. And then we're also looking at how can we in fact do interesting new educational ventures using technology. So we have created at Oxford side a whole new internal educational technology unit. And the whole purpose of the unit is to try to innovate and try to say how can we create innovative new products and services that will serve large numbers of people in interesting new ways. So for example, we are launching a program uh, for female micro entrepreneurs in India and Africa in local languages, WhatsApp delivered with intelligent technology underlying the entire system. And that will be done at scale in a very effective manner using AI. very important question of how inclusive is technology going to be in the future because developing complex technology systems is not easy and not everyone has the power and the resources to develop them even in just simple computational power not every small nation has the kind of supercomputing power and the kind of you know sort of data warehouses to be able to handle the kind of data and computation capacity required so I'm a little pessimistic about this topic because what you're seeing right now is a division in the technology world between largely a US-centric model and largely a China-centric model. And both these models don't really talk to each other very well. And this is a challenge because if you look at innovation, and I study innovation as part of my research, successful innovation has happened through exchange of ideas. So what you often look at the literature and you actually find that the most innovative companies are those that actually buy ideas and pay royalties for new licenses from others, use the knowledge, combine it and actually create new knowledge other people license from them. And the same thing happens in countries too. The most innovative countries learn a lot and they create a lot that is shared from others. If the sharing actually stops or decreases, then I worry about what kind of trajectory will technology take in the future. Will it be a case that now many people are arguing for more sovereign technology platforms? You know, and we saw in the pandemic, already there was pressure to create sort of national technology uh, health platforms. And now people are saying, well, we need AI sovereignty. We need, you know, chip sovereignty. We need different kinds of sovereignties platforms developed. And that might lead to a balkanization of the whole technology space and eventually a decrease in innovation. If you don't share, the innovation rate will in fact decrease. So I hope that uh, globally there is a realization among leaders in the public and private sectors that we do need to come together. We do need to share more. We need, do need to address some of the challenges as we improve technology collectively together because there might be things that one party knows and the other party can learn from. We don't have to rediscover every single thing. So it's very important to encourage sharing, even though the current trend is going in the opposite direction. And I do worry about small countries, and that's where you need international bodies like, for example, the UN to come together and create some kind of platform that will give the smaller countries also access to those kind of resources and those kind of technologies. I'm increasingly hearing of different voices in the United Nations that are arguing for, in fact, creating this kind of global technology access platforms for smaller nations. So that's a discussion and that's happening at a national level. But you can argue the same thing has to happen at a more national, sort of inside a country, intra-country level, where you need the small businesses to also access technology because the small businesses and small organizations don't have the kind of capacity to access technology the way larger organizations might be able to. So there are all kinds of divisions we have to be sort of mindful of, you know, across nations, inside a nation, across 
the rural and the rich sort of city parts, uh, among companies, between the large companies, small companies. So you need some kind of a coordinated policy action. So setting, setting policy will be very important. We're trying to make sure the future of technology is more inclusive. So lots of very complex issues arise around computation capacity, around the data availability, and in fact, uh, who owns the data? Because increasingly right now what is happening is the data ownership is being taken by some of the big tech companies. Uh, you know, if you, for example, use a wearable device, you know, who owns your health data? Uh, in mo many cases, it is a tech company that is making the device that is owning your ho own health data. So think about it, it's your health data, your own personal health record, and you don't have access, you don't have ownership over, over it. And that's a very interesting question that is coming up, and that's a question that we face even in social media, where the big tech companies, you know, they have collected so much information about every single aspect of what we do, and uh, it's our behavior, it's our lives, and often the data about our own lives is not in our control and ownership. And these are very interesting challenges that we face because on one hand, these are very important questions about individual rights and freedoms and you know, the ethical use of data. On the other hand, the very powerful economic interests driving these and sometimes uh, strategic national interests even driving other broader concerns that are creating these kinds of incentives for not necessarily sharing the data ownership and creating the right sort of conducive environment for the future evolution technology.